thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate everybody being here. I know that you all have a lot to do, I'm sure, and many other places to be. Uh, so I appreciate that you have chose to, to join us tonight uh, to talk about some very, very important uh, aspects of our school system moving forward. Um, not the first time we've talked about some of these issues, but uh, definitely a very different sense of urgency uh, as far as moving forward with some proposed grade reconfigurations. So um, please know that um, if you have additional questions um, that aren't answered tonight, you're not comfortable asking tonight, you want to have a follow-up, uh, I'm happy to meet with anybody. So that all means I know, I, God only knows I've sent a ton of emails, you know, just respond to one of them, reach back out, call my office, I'm happy to sit down, happy to jump on a call, do Zoom, whatever you would prefer uh, to make sure that your questions are answered. Um, so um, with that, we can jump right into uh, the discussion tonight. Uh, I always open with our um, strategy, our district improvement strategy, uh, because everything we do is anchored to this, and we are very much committed on making sure that we create a school system where all are welcome and belong. And uh, we certainly know that's a work in progress. Uh, but we are committed to our five C's, character, collaboration, communication, citizenship, and critical thinking. Uh, and I mention those pieces only because as we talk about the building consolidation and the grade reconfiguration, this is still very much at the core of the work that we're gonna be doing moving forward. Uh, so with that, we can jump right in to one of our goals that is anchored to our facilities work. And uh, I won't read this whole uh, thing to you, but I wanted to underscore, good evening everybody, uh, we just got it started, so didn't miss much. Um, <clears throat> but I want to underscore this bottom piece uh, because our facilities challenges are not new. Um, and we'll talk about those in a moment. Um, and the structural issues that we have around grade configuration and you know the number of students our, our district was built for versus the number of students that are here. Uh, that's not a new challenge. Uh, it's one that we've talked about before. Uh, but we do need to start taking action and moving forward um, and addressing some of those. Um, and in this issue of having too much unused space, and that's just kind of the fact of the matter in this particular uh, situation. So why now? So this is a great segue into the too much unused space. Our district was built for over 3,000 students. Our enrollment has stabilized just over 1,500. So I'm very happy uh, that our enrollment was on the upswing, as many of you probably know, during COVID and just after COVID. Um, a lot of public school districts saw a decline in their enrollment, ours did too, uh, but we the past couple of years have climbed and our enrollment is back over 1500 and holding very steady there. That's a good indicator for us. <clears throat> I get the sense that that will probably be uh, where our enrollment stays. We certainly want it to increase uh, and hope that it will, but we do have enough indicators now at this point that we are uh, stable just over 1500 students. Um, so with that being said, we have to right size the district. And when we spoke about this issue about 14 months ago, uh, you know, the narrative is the same as far as that goes. We've got a building, uh, buildings that are constructed for twice as many kids than we have. Um, and so presently in our middle school, we've got 356 students and it's built for 850. Um, our high school is built for 900 students and we have 400 there. Uh, the high school is a separate issue. I know there's been lots of conversation about the feasibility study. We're going to talk about that uh, tonight because it is part of the part of the discussion. Um, and I know it's important to you, so I want to make sure that we talk about it. Um, but be that as it may, it is time for us to have some serious conversations about how do we right size the district? What is the right grade configuration for a district our size with the facilities that we have uh, available to us at this point? Um, we have a capital planning district that's actually changed now to a school building committee because as many of you know, uh, our feasibility study passed uh, the towns, which is fantastic. So we will be embarking on looking at uh, some new configuration of a high school. I don't know what that will be yet. That will come through the feasibility study. Um, but prior to that, we had a capital planning um, committee that did a lot of work studying our facilities. Uh, we have a full capital planning evaluation and assessment. Uh, it is a very comprehensive document. It was done by uh, a third party architect um, that has done some incredible work. DRA is the name of the organization. It's on our webpage. Um, but it was really clear 
what the facilities issues are is uh, along um, as far as the actual systems and structures themselves from boilers to plumbing to the actual envelope of each building, um, which has really helped guide us in our decision making around what kids should go where while awaiting for our feasibility study to happen. Um, so that being said, we started this conversation, you might, some of you were there actually, um, last November, uh, November of 22, not November 23. Uh, we had a community forum and we talked about grade configuration. We talked about the enrollment and we talked about some of the why uh, that we needed to take this issue on. Um, we did put a pause on it for a couple of reasons. You might remember a survey that I had sent out. Um, the feedback from all of you was incredibly helpful. We'll actually look at that in a minute. Um, and I know that after the survey came back in, um, I actually downloaded a PDF version and I sent it back out to the community so you all could see the feedback that we got from our parents and staff. Um, and we'll look at that again this evening because it, it, it actually, it has a very strong voice in the great configuration model that we're proposing as we move forward with our planning. Um, but we did put a hold on that. Uh, there were a couple of other facilities issues along with your feedback that made us pause uh, that work temporarily. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a statement of, uh, of interest that went into the uh, Mass School Building Authority. Um, I've heard a lot of conversation about, um, well, if the feasibility study is supposed to determine, you know, we should have this number of buildings and that number of buildings, why don't we just wait for that? Um, so our statement of interest actually proposed a two building school district. Now, I'm not saying that's where we'll land, but that was what was submitted to the Massachusetts School Building Authority. You have to submit a model. And after the Capital Planning Committee did all of their work, that was the model that was put forward to the Massachusetts School Building Authority, uh, given the number of seats available uh, in this building and what could potentially be a new middle high school if that was the direction the communities wanted to go. Now, that being said, it doesn't have to be that model. It could be something else. Uh, but we had to submit a model, um, and that was the most cost-effective and efficient model at that time when we had done the study. Now, that also doesn't mean that we need to wait for the Massachusetts School Building Authority to say to us, you have too much space, right? We already know that. So while we're waiting for our district to be reviewed and studied by MSBA in a proposal set forward to the communities around what direction we should go as far as a new building or renovation or additions or whatever the ultimate decision is from the School Building Committee to put forward, we still can take some actions, right? We don't need to wait for the state to tell us what to do. Um, and so that brings us into this idea of the need to make the right reductions. So we're going to jump into a budget conversation because we are at a point now where we need to come up with a long-term sustainable plan to, and I want to underscore the, the idea of, of right reductions and sustainable, to be able to manage the loss of state revenues. Um, there has been some conversation that, um, that I have a two and a half million dollar budget shortfall. Um, these are our schools and we need to work together to address those. Um, and so I want I say it that way only because I want you to be partners in this. That's why we call this meeting for tonight. So you can get a sense of where we are. Uh, the idea is that we need to put together a sustainable plan moving forward for our communities because what we have right now is not going to be sustainable for Blackstone or Millville. Uh, and I'm gonna uh, delve into exactly what I'm talking about with that. <laughs> so let's just take a minute and talk a little bit about our funding next year. And I wanna be clear, what you're looking at right here, we do not control this. So I just wanna make sure people understand this. So we have in the governor's budget that was released just a couple of weeks ago. And if you're wondering like, where did this come from? Why did this come on so quickly? We had to wait for the governor to release her budget. Uh, we can't do anything until she does that. Last year, we were later in our, um, in our budgeting process, as was mentioned in a, in a couple of other meetings. Uh, it wasn't us, the governor was new last year. So she didn't have to file our budget until March. So that pushed back our planning for last year. But this year, she had to submit her budget by January 24th. <coughs> Uh, and she did. So it took us some time to get all of the, the um, budget numbers from the governor's budget to determine how much money we're getting from the state. And keep in mind, we get about 
Uh, it's a little bit less at this point, but of our funding from the state. Um, so just as an aside. So unfortunately, this year, we are receiving $130,000 less um, from the uh, state than we've received in the past. Um, you might have heard of something called the Student Opportunity Act. Have you, have, have you kind of heard about that or read about it in the news or, you know, or SOA or sometimes you'll hear some of those acronyms. Um, it's really great for urban school districts. It's really great for high poverty school districts. Um, the poverty level in our school district is about 50%. Um, and that isn't high enough, I guess, to receive any additional funding or support from, uh, from the Commonwealth. So our funding from the governor's budget was reduced by about $130,000. Um, in addition to that, we have, right, remember the COVID dollars and all of the, the COVID funding and some of that money that we've heard about the last few years. So this current school year is our last year with that, with those dollars. Now we did not do what other districts did, which was go out and hire, you know, 15 or 20 people with that money. We actually didn't do that at all. We hired a couple of interventionists and over time we've built those people into our budget that we needed. And the ones that we didn't, because we were able to close some of the learning gaps for our kids, we, we non-renewed them and, and they moved on to other opportunities. Um, but we do have a loss of 430,000 federal dollars that we're just not gonna have next year. And we use that money to offset the assessment to the towns. The next we're looking at a reduction in special education funding by about $380,000 and additional district funds that we had in about $500,000. All of that together we used last year to offset our budget to Millville and Blackstone. We don't have that this year. So before we start along our budget journey, we have a loss of revenue just from this bucket of $1.4 million. Again, this is not a me problem. This is not a mismanagement of budgets. This is, this is fact. This is a loss of state and federal funds. The second issue that we don't have any control over is what is called a minimum local contribution or MLC, you might hear uh, that language. So what that is, the state, as I mentioned there right now, covering a little under 50%, of the, a little under 60% of the budget, they are slowly <coughs> pushing that burden onto the towns. So every year, they are requiring both Blackstone and Mill, uh, Millville to pay more than they did the prior year. That is coming from a formula that has two main pieces. One is property values, and two is income. So they, the state, evaluates each town's property values and income, and they determine how much they feel the towns can pay their schools. So this year, for the third time in a row, uh, Blackstone has seen an increase of over 6%, and Millville has seen an increase of over 5%. So collectively, the two towns are on the hook from the state for an additional $678,000. Again, we haven't asked for anything yet, right? We haven't proposed any of our increase in transportation, contracts, utilities, anything. We are starting out with a $2.1 million issue, right? We have, a, we have a revenue challenge, and then we have the state telling the towns, you also have to pay more. This is all before BMR comes forward with anything. So let's talk about the impact. So in this current school year, our district's operating budget is $27.9 million. So that's what it costs us this year, currently the school year we're in, to run our school system. With all of the increases that were recommended and requested, request is an important word, because request doesn't mean that's gonna be fulfilled. But with all, the, with all the obligations we have, the requests and the, and the pieces that were recommended, we started at a $30.3 million budget uh, request. Now that's about a $3 million increase to our operating budget. Now, we're not landing here, but I wanna show you what that looks like with that loss of revenue that we just looked at in terms of the town's assessment. That is a 25% increase to Blackstone and a 25% increase to Melbourne. Now, I don't think there's anyone in this room 
that would think this is appropriate <coughs> or the right thing to do and not to do it. But I want to show that to you because this is where the school district started its budgeting process. Not where we're ending, but where we started. This is four schools. This is all of the, this is all of the additional asks from our uh, you know, uh, principals and, and other departments, directors, et cetera. So 27.9 is our operating budget right now, right? In this current school year. So reducing the request to 27.9 with all of those other challenges I just showed you in the prior slide, right? The loss of revenue and that minimum local contribution going up. Blackstone would have an 8% increase and Millville would have an 8% increase. Now you might be wondering if this is your budget this year, why is the increase, why is the increase zero? Because we have the loss of that revenue. That's why I wanted to show that in the beginning. Because of these numbers right here and these numbers, a level budget, which is this, still results in almost a 10% increase. And that's what the district asking for is zero. So what's behind that? Looking at a, another possible scenario, the 27.5 million operating budget. So this, that's $400,000 less than we have right now. With the revenue loss that I shared in the prior slide, the percent to Blackstone is about 6% and the percent increase to Millville's is about 5% and then all the way down to a 27.2 million would get you. And we only highlighted this because this will show you what a 3% is to both communities, right? So that's it. That is, if you look overall, it's a $3.1 million reduction in our budget. I'm sharing all of this with you so people understand the urgency in making sure we make the right reductions. The right reductions meaning specifically we need to ensure that our programs and our teachers in front of children are protected and insulated as much as humanly possible. And that we put forward a right-sized district and a right-sized budget that the communities can maintain. We are in strong partnership with both Blackstone and Millville. Yes, we butt heads on things, but they are deeply important to us. We want to ensure that we are putting forward a budget to both communities that can be sustained for the long haul. Because at the end of the day, the kids in the classroom are what matters the most. So I wanted to share these as kind of an anchor piece to our discussion tonight. And some of you might be wondering, like, do we have to do this? Why are we doing this? You know, the region agreement says this, why aren't we following that language? What's going on? We don't have a lot of options here. We just don't have a lot of options. So before we get into this, I wanna share with you consolidating our buildings. And by that, I don't mean the actual buildings like the facility itself. I mean the teams of people that are running them. Schools are expensive things to run. They have a principal, they have nurses, they have custodians, they have head custodians. They have administrative assistants. They have librarians, right? Mm -hmm. All of those positions that aren't necessarily forward facing in front of you know kids, 26 kids in class all day, those are all very expensive things. As everybody knows, involved in the school, right? We get that. So when I say consolidating, I don't mean turning one of the buildings back over to the towns. Could that happen at some point? Uh, at some point, sure. But that's a regional agreement thing that needs to be rewritten and the towns have to be ready and it's a big project. We're not talking about that necessarily right now. What we're talking about is eliminating that school structure, the principal, the nurse, the, the custodian, the head custodian, the, you know, the librarian, all the things that go into supporting that. Remember, the kids haven't gone anywhere. We still have our kids. So we still need the teachers in front of the kids. But we need to consolidate the space that we're, that we're actually running as school buildings. So the proposal is to, right now, although we're technically we're in three buildings, we're running four teams. We have four of everything, principals, head custodians, nurses, librarians, et cetera. So the idea is to consolidate that to three and reconfigure the grade so we're running three actual schools 
instead of the four schools we're running currently. Again, defining schools not by the buildings itself, but by the teams of people we have. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So that in itself will save us, uh, will save the community just, uh, just over $700,000. Just that one piece. That is a significant amount of dollars. And it's something we need to do anyway. And I'm going to say very bluntly and boldly, if we don't take that $700,000 from that school structure, it has to come from somewhere else. And the only other place that is are teachers in front of kids. And we are trying our hardest to not do that. And I, I cannot say that with any more sincerity. Like we, are, we are working very hard to make sure that we get this right size system done right, done once until that feasibility study comes out and, and the community decides how many schools they want to have and what that structure is going to look like. But we don't have the luxury or the time to wait for that. That grace period is gone, as you saw by the loss of revenue earlier. So kind of picking up this conversation where we left it in uh, the fall of 2022, which I know that actually sounds like it was a really long time ago. It was just over a year ago. We met about 14 months ago and had this conversation. Um, but here are some of the survey results that you and the staff said to, said to us. So we had about 433 uh, folks take the survey. And I'll read this to you because I know it's hard to see, but. One of the first questions that we had asked is, is the need for the consolidation clear? And so there were about 66% 66, uh, 66 of you said, yes, it's clear. 22% said it's somewhat clear. And 10% said, no, it wasn't clear. So about 90% of our community that took the survey said, yeah, like we more or less understand that we need to do something. The second question was, does the proposed model make sense? Now, at that time, the proposed model was a preschool through second grade uh, building, a grades three through seven building, that would be here, housed here, and then a grades eight through 12 at the high school. This was the part that made me nervous, was when I looked at the results here. We didn't have quite 60% of people say, yeah, that plan makes sense, right? So you might think, well, 60% is a decent number, but not when you're talking about kids in schools and where they're going to go. And, you know, that, 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 was, that was definitely concerning to, to myself, the leadership team, the school committee. 14%, um, 14.5% said no, it did not make sense. And so we asked. We said, well, what, you know, what's your, what other suggestions do you have? I don't, you know, some of you might remember taking this. And there was a lot of, a lot of ideas. Um, and we, there were 30, <laughs> there was 30 pages of comments, so I didn't want to print them all and hand them out. So I try to consolidate them, but this is, this is what people said. There were a lot of NAs, which was fine. Um, but one suggested we build one big, huge preschool through 12th grade. <laughs> <laughs> no, anybody would want to do that. But that was one of the suggestions. Um, another suggestion was having a PK through four, a five through eight and a nine through 12. Not a bad idea, something that a lot of communities do. My own community, frankly, where I live, does this exact model. Um, but for us, it has a couple of challenges. One, the preschool through fourth grade can't fit into Millville Elementary. That's problematic. So whenever it is the kids end up going back, and staff end up going back, um, they wouldn't fit, like that model wouldn't fit there. So that's problematic. The other challenge is, our eighth graders do a lot with our high schoolers between band, athletics, different clubs and activities, our eighth grade academy, the different pathways we have. Um, so that actually would, would, those kids would miss out on that opportunity. They'd have to do it in the way we're doing it now. The way we're doing it now is okay. It's very expensive because we're shuttling the kids back and forth between the eighth grade academy and the after school activities a lot. Um, that is a very big ticket item. It's about $50,000 additional in transportation to get the kids, you know, whatever it is, two miles. I've run that. I mean, you think I'd know, but I think it's about two miles from school to school. Um, it's just a lot of money. It's not an efficient way to, to set that up for kids who are already so involved in that school community anyway. Um, another suggestion was a preschool through grade eight. 
So do a big PK to eight building and then just have a separate high school nine through 12. Um, and that one was interesting to me because a lot of feedback from our families was they did not want, in our staff, they did not want our third graders with the seventh graders. And we heard that loud and clear. And the parents were very, very clear about that. Um, and the model we had at the time was, you know, separate entrances and separate schedules and, uh, you know, separate academies, the whole bit. And just the community wasn't feeling it. So uh, we scrapped that. And the suggestion that came forward the most was put together a preschool through grade three. That, by the way, does fit in Millville Elementary and at the complex. So there's no issues there, which is great. Uh, a four through seven here, and then an eight through 12 at the high school. So that's the proposed model that we're recommending we move forward with. Again, this model will save our communities just over $700,000 annually. <laughs> Right. It looks as though it's a one-time savings, but the longer we push that out, the more we're paying for that, and the, the more that we're losing those, those savings. So the, in terms of student numbers, uh, these are all next year's projections. Um, Millville would have, or the complex would have, wherever those students are, 480 students. Uh, the middle school would have 495 students, and the high school would have 530 students. So that brings our, our, our total up to about 1505. And again, that number fluctuates all the time. Sometimes it's you know, 1515, 1520, sometimes it's you know, 1500, um, it depends. Um, but this is what we are proposing and what we are going to ask the school committee um, to take action on on March 7th. There will be a public hearing, so we invite all of you to come and speak, you know, speak your mind. Uh, if, if you so choose and you want to give feedback or ideas, you don't need to wait till then, by the way. I hope we do that tonight. That's why we're here. Um, and even after tonight, if you have other questions and comments and things you want to talk about. Uh, but know that there will be a public hearing on March 7th uh, before the school committee takes action on this model. That is a very important date because after that, there will be a budget public hearing. All right, so we've got, to, we've got to get the schools right size to get the budget right size. Once we solidify this model in place, if this is approved, we'll have a public hearing on our budget. And then the school committee, after the public hearing, will certify the budget. So let me pause here. Um, I know that was a ton of information. And I hope, I hope that was clear because in my mind, this is all very clear and connected, but there's a lot of moving parts. Um, so I hope that that was conveyed clearly to all of you, but I'd love to answer whatever questions or your feedback or thoughts or that you might have on any of this. Here and then you can Just for clarity, this lower set, the PK through three, the four to seven, eight, 12, and that's combined both towns. So both Blackstone and Millville students of PK through three would be in one school. Yes. And subsequent. Yep. Um, I'm really glad you said that. Somebody asked me a question about, like, why is it taking this much time to get to this? I want to actually address that publicly. Um, you, so those of you that have been in town for a while might know, until the um, regional agreement was amended in the fall of 2020, we couldn't bring the elementary school kids together. So, you know, I know there was a lot of kind of conversation about, they've been sitting on this for all this time, and they haven't taken the, we couldn't. We couldn't take action on anything until that regional agreement was amended. And the communities did that um, and, and special town meetings in the fall of 2020. Um, so then enter COVID, right? That was a lot of fun. Um, then enter some of the facilities issues that I was mentioning earlier. That just caused us to pause that. So we haven't been sitting on this. We couldn't do it until we had the original agreement amended to allow us to bring the elementary kids together. Because at the time, the prior regional agreement was clear, both towns will educate their own elementary students. That's since been changed, but I just wanted to remind everybody of that because that, that was a question that came up. Did that answer your, um, we had here and here. I actually have two questions. Um, the lower model, the PK3, is there enough room for growth enough? I know we can't predict the future, but is there enough leeway to say if you build X amount of houses or percentage of, of influx of students, that's the first one. Great, that's a great question. 
So at the complex, yes, there's plenty of room. At Millville Elementary, it is, it's tight. It is tight, um, but I want us to keep in mind that our, and I'll tell you what tight means, I will be clear. I will <laughs> speak in vague terms. Um, but I want to keep in mind that our class sizes in grades K and one, which is good, they're right around 18, 19, they're in that, which is good. I say that because they can, they could absorb a couple of more kids in each room if we needed to, right? If we had this big boom and we had, you know, 10 new first graders, we could definitely absorb that. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we need another teacher, right? Um, the grades um, two and grades three for next year are slated to have four teachers each. Grade three will have about 22 kids. Um, so, you know, average is somewhere between, and it's different in every community, but between 22, 26, kind of somewhere in that range. Um, so we still have some wiggle room there. Um, in second grade, the classes will be around 24, 25. So there'll be a couple of extra kids. Now, that being said, art has their own classroom. Music has their own classroom. Our STEM uh, teacher will have the greenhouse area, if that's where, you know, they choose to, if Mrs. Schaefer chooses to put her. Um, and there's still an extra classroom, and there is a variety of offices. So we should be good, but when I say it's tight, that's what I mean. There's not, you know, our, because of this extra space, um, we, you know, some folks have become very comfortable in having two classrooms. Like, so those days are going to be done. So my second question is, is the complex and is sort of, and I know it was last minute and things like that, it's sort of a commodulated, not mess, but it's, it's very um, busy. It's very busy. Um, right, so <laughs> what is the model, I know we, we can only foresee, but what is your model for in this building that it's not gonna be number one as busy or congested? And how are the grades gonna be separated if they're using some of the same units? It's a great question. So our middle school was built for 850 kids. So in this model, we're about, we're about 500, right? So we still have lots of room to expand. You could have sixth and seventh grade on the top floor and fourth and fifth on the bottom floor and an empty floor in between. I'm not saying that that's how it's gonna be set up, but it could be. Um, so there is a lot of room to grow and there's a lot of room to move, move here. Um, we're at some, yeah, you had a question, yeah, sir. She kind of has part of the question, but where does where does elementary school stop and where does middle school start? Are, are they all treated as middle school in this building? No, no. recess, no. No, that's that's great. So uh, no, so the way we have it set up for next year is we're looking at um, self-contained classrooms, right? So your third grade teacher, your fourth grade teacher, your fifth grade teacher, with that teacher all day. That's saying that we're not getting rid of that. Um, in sixth grade is when we transition to teams. Um, and one of the models we're looking at, so this year we have teams of three. So we have an English, it's in sixth grade, we have an English, a math, and a science, and then each teacher picks up a section of social studies. Um, what we are looking at for next year is actually a team of four, English, math, science, social studies. And then doing a split team uh, between sixth and seventh grade. Um, so that other team would have two sixth grade sections, two seventh grade sections, and then there'd be a straight seventh grade. So the teaming model would preserve the middle school structure for grade six and seven, so the kids would be able to get used to that before high school. Um, and then the uh, uh, fourth and fifth grade will be with their classroom teacher all day. So no recess? No, oh, no, the recess. Oh, of course, yeah. Actually, we've talked about, too, getting some of the, um, uh, you know, the basketball hoops. You put the cement in the back, and you kind of, so we can put some, you know, some hoops and things out for the kids, buying additional recess equipment. Um, and running a, an elementary kind of model like that for a young kids. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I have two questions too. I just want to clarify because I'm just thinking tax purposes and stuff. Mm -hmm. Your intention is the pre K through three, as of right now, would be Millville, four through seven here, eight through twelve is BMR, and the complex is along the off the grid. So the model right now is to have th these great configurations. I don't know where the PK through three is going to be yet. Okay. Yep, we're not sure yet. Um, It'll be one of the buildings. Will that, and you might not have an answer for this, and that's totally fine because I still haven't wrapped my head around all of it yet. Should it be at the complex, will that have a huge financial, <coughs> like, will that play into any financial anything for the town of Millville if you decide to put 3K for 3K at the complex instead where all three schools are going to be in Blackstone? Great question. So, two pieces. 
the first is with the MSBA. Um, um, I know there's been conversation with the boilers at Millville Elementary. We've worked very closely with them. Um, they have been incredibly gracious. They understand. They understand Millville's working hard and trying to address those issues. Um, and they have been they have been fine with with us not having children in that building. They are also aware um, that we're not sure what the model will be next year yet. I think we'll know soon, but we just don't know yet. Um, and they've been very understanding of that. Um, so there wouldn't be additional burden on the taxpayers from that perspective. The other side of the equation, remember for us to give a building back to a community, like to officially be done with the building and turn it over to Millville or to Blackstone, that's a regional agreement issue, specifically as it relates to the capital assessments in each town and how each town pays for the capital costs. So our district is kind of funky in that the middle and high school are owned by the school system. So the regional school district actually owns the middle school and high school in our assess, you know, basically 75% of the capital set, uh, costs to Blackstone, 25% to Millville. But the elementary schools are owned by the towns. So if we were to permanently close one of the elementary schools, which, I, which by the way, this doesn't say we're doing that. It just says we're going to three buildings next year and three teams. Um, the, all of that has to be worked out with regional agreement. And that, that's going to take time. That's going to definitely take some time. But it would like stay a regional agreement, like Blackstone couldn't turn around next year and be like, sorry, no, no, it's a bad you. It would be incredibly costly to okay. either community to try to get out of the region. Okay. Very, very costly. My second completely unrelated question. Um, my son is going to be an eighth grader next year. If you were to go with this model, is the thought process that you guys have now, are they going to be like on the high school schedule or are they still mm. kind of the same question he had? Is it going to be more middle school S until it starts in grade? So thankfully we have a couple of high schools in our area. Uh, Megan's principal is one of them, <laughs> that in Bellingham, but that has an eight through 12 model. And what we have learned from our friends that have done this is just integrate them. Okay. A lot of the other schools have tried to start with an eighth grade team and almost keep it separate. And it inevitably, it, the kids just do better when they're part of the community. So that was the sentence Ms. Fowler, our principal of the high schools in the back. And I know that's the plan that she has is to integrate the eighth grade right into the building and be part of the structure like everybody else. Really good questions. Yes. I have a question. Um, so buses, I'm not crazy about the idea of like fourth grader being on a bus with a seventh grader. Mm -hmm. um, and then last year, back to his question, we had talked about possibly getting a playground structure put in if, if we're gonna have younger students at recess here. Yeah. Um, where's Ms. Rocco? <laughs> <laughs> so three, so let me ask, let me answer that question first. Um, we will share that information with the staff, uh, with the families next week. Uh, we haven't talked to the staff yet. So I, I, with all due respect to the teachers that are working, the staff that are working directly with the principals, we want to share that structure with the with the with the teachers and the staff in the buildings first so if you just give me a little just a little patience we will share that with our community next week like where people are as far as the structure is there um and that's an important question and i get that uh, and so we'll we'll turn that back around to you very quickly next week. um the uh, second piece about the buses we're not crazy with that either the fourth and the seventh grade we get that we're looking at some different models we don't have a great one yet being fully honest with you, you know, there's a bunch of different options, right? There's, you know, keep the building on two different schedules. You keep the older kids with the older kids, have them start earlier, the younger kids with the younger kids, have them start later. That, oppo that poses so many other challenges and problems. Do you create a third tier and put four and seven together, but less buses instead of two, right? Start and end times to the schools in the district. You could have three. There are districts that one, three, three tiers of buses. Um, so we are looking at all options right now. That's one that we're going to have to get back to our to our families on, but I can tell you that we don't love that idea either. The four and seven on the same bus, um, so I don't have a good answer for that yet. But I I can promise you we're working on it, working with our transportation company, working with our leadership team, trying to figure out what the best. The other side is. of that is I don't know if my fourth grader is ready to start school as early as right. the middle school mm. children. Yeah. Child care issues. 
Yeah, right. There's a lot of challenges with that. So that's right. And then so then the other challenge on that, we do have some seventh graders that participate <laughs> in high school activities. So like, you know, there's there's definitely a, a conflict if, if they have a later start and then the high school gets out at two, they're trying to get to, you know, either one of the athletics, they're trying to get to drama club, they're trying to get to band, and they're coming in an hour after those kids have already been at rehearsal practice games. There's so like there's a bunch of logistic pieces that we still have to work through. Um, that we are, but we're just not there yet. Uh, but you had another question, and I want to lose sight of it. Playground. So we actually had an estimate done for a new playground. Um, we've got a lot of work to do in terms of figuring out if we're going to be able to do that for next year or not. One of the things that I would encourage us to do, and I have done this uh, in my prior district, it was super fun. Um, we had a small group of us that actually wrote a grant. You can purchase uh, almost like a prepackaged playground and the community comes in on like a Saturday and we build it together. Uh, it's just fun. It's a cool, creative way to get the community together, uh, get everybody involved. It's super positive. Um, so just putting it out there, I'm looking at my PTO people that are <laughs> now hiding, but um, we have had an estimate done. We do have a model that we could use. Um, the question will be around the next steps, how quick and how we actually can start. Jason, that was actually years ago. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's great, right? Yeah, so hope we'll probably look at some things. Please. Right, so we've talked a lot about Milda, the problems with the Milda school, and over and over again. I just want to know: has there been a full assessment done of JFK AFM? Because that's technically our oldest building. Yeah. It's our most decrepit, if you look at it. Yeah, sure. Um, and quite honestly, aesthetically, I don't really want my kid in that building. Yeah, I totally hear you. Millville is a beautiful facility, and my office is there. We love it over there. It's gorgeous. We hope at some point we can move all of our preschool through third graders back there. I just don't know when that some point is. To your second uh, piece about the assessment of the building, we've had a full capital assessment done. The building. And I'm happy to share with anybody who wants it. It's a, like it. Yeah, it's a very lengthy document, but you can actually see uh, not only what the challenges are, but you can see what the costs are yeah. um, as far as repairing from the floors to all the other things in the building that need to be done, the foundation. Uh, all of that. So well, I'd be happy to. Been jumped through the dirt a lot. I mean, it has with all of this water issue. It'd be nice to be fully transparent. The problems with all of this. Hundred percent. We have been from the, from jump, and I'm happy to share whatever information people. We love MES. We hope our kids are back there at some point. We just don't know when. Yes. So I think the middle school and high school still are well below the numbers that they can um, handle. So. What, and I know that this is going back and forth a lot, but why wouldn't we do a junior, senior high in high school and do 7 through 12 and have maybe the sports um, consolidated or other clubs consolidated if there's some room and then kind of have more people here if they'll build so tight? We had quite a bit, so so great point, and that used to be the model, right? It was 7 through 12 at one point. We actually got a lot of parent feedback in our last survey that, that did not like that. Um, concept. No, it wasn't in that design, but there was some worry about having seventh graders in the same building on the same, you know, you know there aren't the same buses, but that was mentioned as well, on the same buses with the juniors and seniors. Um, so it was another, you know, it was, it's, I think it's one of those things that everybody's going to have an opinion on either way. You know, I think some will like it and some won't. Um, but that's a great point. Um, you had a question, sir. Yes. So, any of these models show that my two fourth, fourth graders are going to be sitting on a bus with seniors or juniors or sophomores? Uh, so, it would depend. It would depend on what what avenue we would take with the with the tiers for the buses. Our goal would to have that not happen, right? The goal would would be to um, either, if we can, keep them on with the younger kids, but then we're going to have. The kindergarten or first grade or second grade parents that don't want their kid in the bus with the older kids, uh, which is why we're looking at that third tier, where it would be basically the four through seventh graders. Um, I don't know if that's doable yet because we have to look at all the bus runs and how many actual buses we would need. Right now we have 15 buses in two different runs. So the question is, can we consolidate some of the routes and create a three tiered system um, but it's going to end up being three different start times, end times that will cause, I'm sure, other challenges for parents. And, you know. So, 
So just to be clear, that could be a possibility. It could be. It's not likely, but it could be. None of us like that idea either. Are there other um, communities in Massachusetts or locally that their districts are similar size to us that we can look at their model and see? Because no matter what, you know, I have a first and a third grader, so I think what's happening second and fourth, and I think everyone is here because they're concerned, which is great that everyone's here. But there's always problems with change, and there's always resistance to change. And I think if we can look at the data of other school sets in the area and see, you know, coming, both of us are from Hopedale, uh, you know, being a junior senior high, and we seem to be just fine. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I would vote for that, but of course, you know, I don't have a seventh grader and a 12th grader to know kind of the differences there. Sure. I know both Uxbridge and Bellingham have a similar, not exactly the same, but a similar model to what to what is in front of you this evening. So we certainly you know. the Bellingham so I went to Bellingham, so Bellingham's exactly that pre K through three and then two elementary, so <coughs> and then four through seven and then um, eight through twelve. And the buses are similar. I think they do three bus farms down yeah. I'm thinking of and you probably know. I think there's the three tiers, that. yeah. And, but they do have fourth graders and seventh graders on the bus together. I don't work in that building, so I, but I've never heard any like horror stories about the buses. So I don't. But I don't know. I mean, I, to be clear, you can have fourth grade together and fifth grade can have problems with a fourth grade. Right. Sure, sure, sure. There's more issues right now with our first and fifth graders as yeah. it is on our buses than it would be fourth and seventh. Because the seventh graders would likely just ignore the younger kids. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. So the fourth through seventh. You're in one building typically, right? So would the structure be one principal over the whole building or one leader? So if there's a general assembly, they're all going to be in the same? There would be one principal overseeing the 495 students so and staff. If they were in a general assembly or if they had something, there could be a possibility that the four through seven are completely together. If there was a reason to call an assembly for grades four through seven, then yes. The likelihood that that would occur is 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 slim. You wouldn't have even if you were going to do um, a presentation or a guest speaker or my sense is like we do at the high school. You do your kind of your freshman and your sophomores in one group, and then your eleventh grade and twelfth graders in another. Uh, we just did that with our district attorney's office that was here. So I'm assuming that the principal would divide the the uh, the grades up into two separate. Yes. Will the current fourth graders have a, a celebration at the end of the year, like a graduation, considering that we leave in the school? I'm sure the principals will be part of work putting something together okay. for all of the, yeah, for that kind of celebratory, yeah, yeah send off kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Might be more of a comment than a question. <coughs> so as a builder of residence, I, I kind of think about all the work and the tax dollars that have been sucked into revamping the issue of building elementary water. Um, and you gotta, you gotta kind of think too that with that water issue, all the money has kind of sunk into that. Really, I kind of take that in perspective when it comes to the, the schools in which we're choosing. From my understanding, the building water is doing very well, uh, testing very well. But it's just more of a comment that I think a lot of the middle residents, I don't know how many of us are in this building, um, that I think a lot of the middle residents might have a little bit of an issue with sure. the building, so that gets sent back to the town. Understood. Is there an estimated time that one school had an idea of like pre K to three? Like, we know when they'll build is if like the water could be involved? I hope soon. We have a meeting tomorrow evening. Um, we're going to get some more information. I know Jennifer will be there and the director of the regional uh, DEP, the central uh, central office area, Mary Jude, will be there um, speaking to some of the water quality issues. Um, so you know, I don't I don't have a specific date. I hope it's soon. It's on the agenda to discuss, and tomorrow night, well, I don't know what will come of that, but. And I don't have more information for that. So if we go to the Bill Bill website that the Science and Action Plan that was updated in January, and you'll see that the Hillary K. Bassett, which was the first driver of the issue, has been very low. It's been 360 parts per million, and the highest we have been is 24 and it's low as 18. And then the second issue that came up was the tri-power and testing under, you know, 44 was the high number um, since October. And we already have our January results, so that's four months there as well. Um, 
And we also voted to provide bottled water for the first two months of school, just in case anyone's concerned for the change in the volume of students, because that's going to change the way the well processes the water. Um, and if there's a blip on either one of those two months, we'll continue to provide bottled water for two more quarters to ensure that the testing until we can get it back under control. But we have a really good water operator. I will say he's eccentric. Um, but he's like super smart, but he tours and, and speaks with the, you, the federal level of the EPA and things like that. So, um, you know, you can't really argue with his expertise. We're very confident, especially since he, he's also putting some additional technology for remote monitoring and things like that. So, you know, we're very, the consistency has been there. So, I feel very confident in terms of the quality of water. And we've been helping Millville run the water at capacity. The test results before we were running about 500 gallons a day. So now we've got it up to 1500, which is what it would be with everyone in the building. So we're looking to see if we can, you know, replicate those results with the water usage at capacity to see if, you know, we'll have the same impact. When did you start running the water at capacity? January, when is Scott? It was the last Monday of January. The last Monday of January. Okay. And it was at some time in January. Yeah, so a couple of like two weeks ago, maybe. So the so the numbers that you've been getting, while they sound good, are with the building with just the central office staff. Right, which is about five hundred gallons a day. So those numbers may not be quite so We don't know. What, we, I'm not sure. I've seen. We just started running it at extra capacity a couple of weeks ago. The real issue on them having the uh, problems of boards, there wasn't enough chlorine dosing in the system, and. So now that we have the remote monitoring and we can look at what the core of the manganese and iron is coming into the system, um, I'm glad I had two semesters of chemistry in college. Um, and so, but now that we see what's coming in through the raw water um, with the remote monitoring that we have in there and some automation, yeah, automation, that's not the right word. Anyway, the other technology we have in place, I'm not concerned at all. Technology we think, as um, Joe mentioned, we spent, I think, $40,000 on equipment to make sure that if the capacity changes, the quality of the water does not change. Good questions. And so, I'm okay. so, and that's why, because of the, um, if the capacity were to change those numbers, that's why we're offering. So if sorry, if it's good. if it changes and you have to provide bottled water, are we expecting the students to wash their hands with bottled water? No. It's Just not the state. Yeah, it's okay. not that. So this is also on the website. If someone made statements that it's unsafe to wash their hands with the this water and that's not true. Um, and I think when we make statements that are wrong, taking them down is not good enough saying, hey, I said this and it was wrong, I'll show you to fix it. Because this has been circulating since August and I corrected it many, many times. And it's exhausting that that information gets out there. People are like, what about this? And I'm like, oh, it's wrong. So I'm sorry that my on the wrong information. Other questions? Yes. Do you have a time frame estimate of when you're going to expect to know where those deviations of the schools will be? Like, is it something that families will know in the summer or? Well, oh, you'll, you'll know very soon. You know, the, no, that's a good question. <coughs> the plan after tonight is to actually send out another survey of families. So get all of you, now that we have a chance to talk about it. And, you know, our friends at home that couldn't be here, we have this live streaming, so it'll be up on our YouTube channel. So, you know, Copy and paste the link, send it out, get, you know, so everybody gets the information. We want as many people to know what's going on as possible. Um, we'll send a survey out to the community. Again, we're asking the same, you know, asking very similar questions to this. Like, does, does this, do you get the understanding? Like, does it make sense? Is why we have to do it? Does the model make sense? Do you have other thoughts? Uh, we're going to collect all of that feedback. Um, there is urgency around that public hearing, though, because we need to make sure that we have 
uh, both of the towns have voted uh, to move our public hearing date from uh, the before the January 1 to March 15th. I know that issue came up too, I think. Both, um, uh, Millville took a vote on January 8th um, to make that move. And then Blackstone also has done the same, uh, which is helpful so that we can actually have these conversations and move forward. We can't amend the regional agreement that way, but um, that additional grace period has been helpful for us to be able to make some of these decisions. Um, so we'll be sending out a survey to our families and staff um, now that we've had a chance to connect with everybody in the next few days, you'll probably get it on Friday. Um, so please take a few minutes and fill it out. Make sure that you know that you give your opinions, your thoughts. Um, if you have other suggestions and other configurations, you know, share those. Um, you know, the, the more voices we hear, the better. It certainly helped the last time. Um, it led to some of the changes. It led to some of the pause that we put on it. But I think looking at the numbers, I hope people see that you know, we do, we need to take action for next school year. That part we can't, you know, we can't wait. So, you know, certainly before March 7th, people will know what the configuration is. Um, and the sooner we get the survey results back from our community, the quicker I can turn around and share the results with everybody. How do you obtain that if you're new to the school district and you have like a kindergartner going into the program? So we're gonna send this out. We'll send it like via email. We will put this, we did this the last time too. We put it on our social media. Uh, just a link for the survey <clears throat> and you know we trust that people will and they'll, they usually you know it'll ask like you know what what group are you a parent are you a staff member etc so we'll put it out on our social media we'll put it on our web page and we'll email it out to try to get as many participants as we can yes please once the decision is So we're literally looking into that three-tiered model now. Uh, Jill Pilligal Ryan is our assistant student service director. Um, so <coughs> Jill, she's working on that project now with our transportation company. So I hope we'll have that information sooner than later. We're looking at every possible, and the problem is with the scheduling. To get something, we have to give something. So like we're, we're, you know, there's it's not possible that all of us are going to be happy with every single thing that comes as a result of this. It's just. I wish, but it's just not possible. And it might be a busing issue. It might be something else. I don't know. But um, when it comes to scheduling, I was a middle school principal for 10 years. Like when you change the schedule, you never get what you're looking for without giving up something else. So we have to figure out like what are those things that we can all kind of live with when we think about the scheduling and the busing and, you know, and everybody has a different opinion, right? Like we were sharing earlier, our parent here was sharing about first graders and fifth graders versus <laughs> I caught you on your phone. Sorry. Right. <laughs> first, Sorry. Graders and, yeah. first graders yeah. and fifth graders versus seventh, you know, fourth graders and seventh graders. No, there were still some questions being asked. No, it's true. It's middle, I teach middle school, and quite honestly, fourth and seventh is not a huge jump. One and five right now is huge. The stories mm. my second grader comes home with about fifth graders treating her on the bus are ridiculous. Mm. It's too big. Fourth and seventh is really not that big deal. I would argue fourth through twelfth is just as big as a gap. Yep, yeah, I agree. Yeah, if not or eleven or ten or even nine. Yep. I mean, when I was a kid, I went to Bellingham and it was seven through twelve. It was like K yep. through six and then mm -hmm. seven through twelve, and we survived that time. And that's I what mean, we I remember it being negative. We like, all lived through BMR seven through twelve, and we're still here just fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. I just wanted. Um, not to end, but maybe towards the end, to say that um, there were a lot of concerns initially when we were talking about MES closing and then everyone going to the complex, and I think there were so many concerns, and my very limited um, time in the schools and talking with staff and being with students did really, really well in a very short time and really turning it around, and I know that we're all here, we're all concerned, but I don't know that we always give our kids the most benefit of the doubt that they're very resilient and that they will be of the same cohort, they'll be with their same classmates and move forward and they're excited to go to another school and maybe there's an eighth grader that's a great mentor that they look up to that they'll have the relationship with. So I know that it's very scary and change is always scary, but I'm hoping to um, bring us all together and say that the kids did really well and I think that was, I mean, in my um, understanding, a pretty quick turnaround, like much quicker than what we're looking at now. I think about what they went through with COVID, having to 
your school with masks on. And I mean, I was absolutely terrified. I'm sure everybody else was too, but who it didn't affect the most were my boys. It was like such a non-issue, even though I made it such an issue, it wasn't a non-issue. I think that's a good point. Jason, you did say you were going to go back to the high school issue at the beginning of this presentation. You said you touched back. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, feasibility study yeah. and all of that. Where are we at the high school? Yeah, thank you for that question. So, um, two things. Uh, we are going to be uh, at, on the April board meeting agenda for Mass School Building Authority uh, to officially vote in the feasibility study, which is great. Once that happens and we can hire an OPM, which is known as project manager. They're the person that kind of manages the actual project for the, for the system in the towns. Um, they will come in and look at four different uh, pieces. So they're gonna look at different grade configurations. They're gonna look at different building structures, three buildings, they're gonna look at two buildings. They're gonna look at um, a six through 12 option in terms of addition renovation. They're gonna look at a seven through 12, an eight through 12, a nine through 12. Um, and they're gonna put all of that information together and send that over to the school building committee. And I would encourage any of you, if you can, or you know, attend a school building committee meeting. They're actually really interesting and we're really into the work now in terms of talking about kind of where we're going. Um, and so once we get all of that feedback, and that should take, my hope is that a, maybe a year from this special town meeting, so this November, November 24, hopefully the communities are voting on what structure they want to be moving forward and putting that plan in place. It takes about a year to get the feasibility study done. That will that that window kind of that that clock starts ticking in April when uh, the board approves that. Um, they can't approve it till we did, till the towns did. You, you all did that in November, um, and then it starts from there. So uh, they're going to look at those different models and then put forward to the school building committee all of those different options. And then the school building committee will put forward to the communities. At this point, is this even something that our children can benefit from? We are, like? Yeah, so we're about, uh, from now, we're about a year and a half, almost two years out from the feasibility study being done. Right. And the build would be about a two to two and a half year build. So we're still, we're just under five years, thereabouts. I mean, there could be issues with supply chains, yeah, and all right. that, but, <laughs> but somewhere around there. Yeah. I know all these things are super connected, so it was hard to talk about one and not not the other. So I appreciate everybody's time and candor and all that stuff. And, and I, you know, and again, I, I think my first meeting with everybody six years ago was when you talk about people's children and you talk about people's money, it becomes very intense, very uh -huh. quick, um, and it should. So I get that. Anything else before we wrap up? I would encourage any of you or any folks watching at home or anyone you shared the video with or information with, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm happy to sit down and talk with anybody at any time about any of this. So, okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a good night.